Welcome. All right, so many of us have heard of weak pawns. We've heard that pawns can be weak. We've maybe even heard of backwards pawns, isolated pawns, doubled pawns. And we've just been told that these pawns are weak, avoid them, try make your opponents have them. Um, but many of us haven't actually thought about why these pawns are weak. What is it that makes them weak? What quality do they have that sucks so much, right? Well, the basic principle is this. If a pawn can't be defended by another pawn, then it's weak, right? Or if it's difficult to defend with another pawn, then it is potentially weak. You know, really, the weakness of the pawn depends on how easily it can be defended and whether the defender it would be a, another pawn. You know what I'm saying? So an isolated pawn has no friends around it. It's a loner. It can't be defended by another pawn simply because there are no friendly pawns next to it, right? A backwards pawn is weak because it's backwards. It's behind the other pawns. It can't be defended because pawns defend diagonally forward, right? Doubled pawns aren't always weak, um, but if they're doubled and isolated, then they're super weak because um, they can't be defended and also they get in each other's way and they're kind of immobile. But what I want us to think about is that it's actually the squares that are weak in those cases. Right, the squares that the pawns are sitting on can't be defended by other pawns. And that's what makes them weak. Um, so what if there's no pawn there? What if it's just the square that's weak? Is that still a problem? Well, this game is going to show us that, yes, it is still a pretty significant problem. So we've got Dominic playing white and Floor, Floor, F-L-O-H-R, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Fleur was playing black. This game was played in 1935, so another nice classic game. And we have a Sicilian. Okay, great, great. Already, move three, Dominic is weakening squares. <laughs> so he's going for a Maroxy bind setup, which is where you have these two pawns really just um, exerting a lot of control over the d5 square. I'm not so sure that this is really great in a setup where black's gone e6 already because that kind of fights for the d5 square um yeah the downside of the setup is that you're weakening squares in the d file these two squares that have highlighted can no longer be defended by a pawn right so they're weak is that a problem uh it can be it can be so black gets out of peace you know great attacking the d4 square developing a knight <laughs> makes total sense and white does this, because white doesn't want to have a backwards pawn. If white did that, the pawn would be backwards, it would be weak. So white just gets rid of it. Okay, great. Um, just normal stuff. Yeah, so I would kind of think that this would be a normal way to play. Um, yeah, it just seems a bit more principled to me, just getting pieces out. But white decides to take. Okay. <laughs> whatever can't argue with that um and now we're faced with a choice do we take with a b pawn or with a d pawn and i'll give you a couple seconds to think about which might be better okay well hopefully you considered both options and chose the right one <laughs> so if you take with a b pawn um you run to e5 and this isn't necessarily the end of the world you can go to g8 get this bishop out somewhere and then bring the knight here um, and start pressuring the e5 pawn but this just doesn't feel too great to me um, if you ever go d5 white's going to take on percent so you really need to try win this pawn somehow which I don't think will actually happen um, you got the b file but it's not uh, you know it's not such a big thing they can go b3 um, so this doesn't look too great to me on the flip side if you take with a d pawn instead, like this, okay, you're giving up your right to castle, but what you've done is you've opened up the d file, right? And white's got two weak squares on the d file. So you're gonna be able to bring your rooks in and attack these squares. You're gonna see later in the game that that is exactly what black does and it works really well. So clearly he was onto something, 
when he took the D pawn. Um, you've given up the right to castle, but it doesn't matter. The queens are gone. Um, you're not going to get attacked. You're not going to get checkmated. Your king's going to be very happy over here. Um, in an end game, the king will be close to the center, which is nice. So this is just nice for black. I would much rather play black in this position. So now we have f3. Um, we have to think about e5. And this is the kind of move we need to think about when we play knight of 6 in the first place. As opposed to, I don't know, this. Um, when we play knight of 6, we must always think about what happens if the pawn comes here. So takes, 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 and e5 should be something we have seen back when we played knight of 6. Right? So can you think about what black should do after e5? I'll give you a couple seconds once again. Alright, well, yeah, the knight comes here. Um, this is a pretty classic response to e5. In some situations where you can't go there, then the knight goes here, and you get a different sort of position. But when you can, it's very nice to go knight there because you actually attack the e-pawn and you force white to defend. So the bishop goes here. Bishop c5. Very, very sweet. We're threatening to take a pawn. So the bishop goes back. Then the bishop just comes here. Nice. Um, we're going to win the e-pawn because we're attacking this pawn. So white needs to do that. And then we can just take this pawn. Great. Um, so for that reason, e5 is just terrible for white. E4. This, I feel like this is even worse because we're coming here. Um, yeah, this just looks quite horrible for white. I think we're winning an exchange. Um, because the knight's going to come here, the rook's going to move, and then we're going to check and pick up the the rook over there. So I don't think f4 is a possibility. Anyway, so white goes f3, and now they are threatening to go e5, because there's no knight g4 now, since they've gone f3, right? So what do you do? You play e5 yourself. Great. Absolutely great. And you're stopping the e-pawn from moving, you're opening up your bishop, very nice. You're controlling this square. Super importantly, you're controlling this square, this weak square. Um, yeah, this is looking quite bad for white, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, it's it's not cataclysmic, but I'd really rather play black in this position. Anyway, the bishop goes there, makes sense. It's a good spot for the bishop. You're just controlling this square, controlling that square, very nice. Um, black gets the king out of the way, okay, cool. And then this, like, I don't know what Dominic was thinking. <laughs> why, why would anyone do this? What does this move do? Um, okay, maybe, maybe he was worried about, about a pin. But if you're so worried about getting your pawns doubled, then do this, right? Um, I'm just, I'm just at a loss to understand this move. He might be preparing b4. But b4 is always going to run into a5. Like, that's that is a plan for after you've already developed your pieces, right? It's you're not going b4 now. It makes no sense. Um, yeah, strange, strange, strange move. And like the the e4 c4 setup that Dominic um, got in the first couple moves of the game, this weakens the square. It weakens the b3 square. And what you have to remember is that every weakening of a square is permanent. You can't take back a pawn move, right? So this square is weak for the rest of the game. These squares are whoopsie. These squares are weak forever. There's nothing you can do about it. So you really have to think carefully about playing a move like this. Um, I'm not a fan of this move. I think it's quite dumb, and uh, Fleur takes pretty good advantage of it, like this. So. This is okay. It breaks principles. In the opening, we always say you should get your pieces out, all of them, before you start moving the same piece twice. But because the queens are traded, it's not such a train smash that um, that we're breaking some principles because we're not going to get mated, right? The king's safe here. Nothing's going to happen. It's fine. So we can break principles in order to achieve some aim. In this case, the aim is trading off this bishop. Goes, uh oh, we've got pawn on a dark square in the center, 
and a dark square bishop. So this bishop is always going to be kind of hemmed in by the pawn. On the flip side, this is white's bad bishop because of these pawns. And this is white's good bishop. So we want to get rid of our bad bishop for white's good bishop. Hence this move, allowing us to come here. Um, if white tries to stop us, we just do this. And this is quite uncomfortable to deal with. They can't really defend this pawn, so they have to push it. And then we can just do this anyway. And now these pawns are weak. We've got weak squares all over the place. This is just nice for black. Um, so the knight comes here. <laughs> now I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to put your knight there, then why were you so worried about the bishop coming here anyway in the first place? Like, if you're going to go a3, at least put the knight here. Anyway, very strange. Maybe, maybe he was trying to defend this square a little bit. Who knows? Who knows what Dominic was thinking? Or if he was even thinking. Anyway a5 so now it is necessary to start b4 because if we go like this right away then b4 comes with tempo against the knight and now white can kind of do what they want they can do this or whatever now a5 doesn't work so we have to go a5 first before we get our pieces out okay okay the bishop develops now a4 <laughs> yeah so once again Um, actually, you know what, I didn't see anything wrong with this. I'm sure black can just go bishop c5 right away. Um, maybe he was thinking about this. Maybe he was thinking about b3. And then, let's say this, and then the rook coming here. And a slow prepare preparation for b4. Maybe he didn't want to allow b3. Um... Yeah, you know what? I, I think that's it. That's actually quite a deep idea. So he goes a4 right away instead of going bishop here because of that b3 idea stopping a4. Um, yeah, okay. So a4, just controlling this square. If white ever goes b4, we're just going to take en passant. If you don't know what that is, uh, Google it. Um, so yeah, a4, controlling the weak square. Great. We've got it. E, well, our e-pawn controlling this weak square, this pawn's controlling that one. Hopefully we're going to bring our rooks here, that's our next goal. This is just looking very simple, very clear cut, and pretty good for black. So the king goes to f2. Yeah, I mean, castling makes no sense here, because um, it's pretty much the end game already, the queens are gone. So you want your king near the center, so that it can help out. Um, yeah, finally the bishop goes here. Ooh, took long enough. It takes, takes. And this is very nice. The knight can't be kicked away from here. We've got weaknesses here, here, and here. This is just looking pretty good for black. So the rook goes to c1. For some reason, who knows. Alright, and then finally, we finish our development. Great. Rook is there, rook there. And the king goes here. So, w with our rook coming here, our plan is obviously to double the rooks, right? We want to control this d file, especially because it's got weak squares in it. So, if white tries to stop us, like this, then we can actually take immediate advantage of the weak square situation, like this. Okay, knight b3. If the rook moves, we're going to just trade rooks and then bring our rook in, and then we control the open file but that's great so they have to trade and bring the rook here um, this runs into that and that's no good that is no good at all um, we're gonna get rid of this bishop then we're gonna win this pawn white can't allow this so the rook goes here and we win the pawn anyway um, yeah, so knight f1 is a problem, it loses a pawn. So the king comes here instead. Right, we're going to double the rooks. Okay, great. And now white needs to do something, so they're preparing for, for f4 and f5. Okay, whatever, do we care? Nope. f4, yeah, we take it. And now, pause the video. This is the move to find. If you want a hint, 
I'll give you one. Take advantage of the weak squares. Okay, well, hopefully you found it. If you didn't, don't worry. It's a tough move to find. Black played rook d3. Whoa, okay. Remember how I said that we're going to use our rooks to take advantage of these weak squares? And that was the whole point of taking with the d-pawn instead of the b-pawn earlier when they traded knights? Remember how I said that? Yeah, now it becomes relevant. So takes, takes, takes. And the king goes to f2. If the king goes to e2, I mean, come on. We're just doing this, right? And black's going to be up. So yeah, so we check, we win the knight. We're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is 1, 2, okay. Let's just do this. Yeah, so we're going to win one of these pawns, right? We're going to be up a little bit of material. Our king is nicely centralized. This is pretty much winning for black, right? Um, we've already got six pawns versus five, and we're going to win another one. This is just, it's all over. So the king went to f2 instead, but the bishop still goes to g4. And again, this is an example of a weakened square coming in handy. If the pawn was still on f3, this wouldn't be a problem, right? But because white insisted on going f4, now we see this. So hitting the rook, uh-oh, e5, yeah, there's nothing you can do about this, right? If the rook moves, we just take the knight. So you're going to lose the rook. So e5, takes, takes. And now, many of us would just go here. Many of us would go straight there. Um, Fleur is smarter than that. He did this first provoking the pawn to come forward and it has to come forward there's nothing else you can do you can't protect that pawn with the king because your rook is like a laser beam over here so you provoke the pawn forward you go here you provoke it forward again take take now this pawn is like impossible to defend our king is just going to come and gobble it whenever he wants and now you go to b3 great so the d4 square, the d3 square, and the b3 square were all instrumental in this whole plan, right? Which kind of goes to show that uh, positional weaknesses lead to tactics, right? A good position gives you tactics, and the specific weaknesses that someone creates are often their downfall, right? So the knight goes here, can't be taken because you lose the rook, right? So the king goes here, and then we trade, and the king comes here. Um, Dominic resigned in this position. I don't know if I would resign. I would play it out, but he's definitely losing completely. It's a matter of counting. So it takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whoops, eight, nine, ten, eleven moves for Dominic to get a queen. On the flip side, it takes one, two, three three, four, whoopsie, um, <laughs> let's do it again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight moves for Fleur to get a queen, right, 11 versus 8, we're going to have a queen back on the pawn still like over here, right, this is just totally winning for black, It black's going to get a queen, there's nothing you can do about it, um, yeah, this endgame is losing for white. And if I turn on Stockfish, it says minus 7.5. <laughs> um, because of that maneuver where... Where is it? Yeah, because of that maneuver where he forced the pawns to come forward. That's what actually won in the game. Um, because he's coming here and he's going to win that pawn and then get a queen. Okay, great. So, the lesson of this game is that... Firstly, Dominic... Um, wasn't very good. <laughs> no shame. I shouldn't be rude to him. But yeah, the lesson of this game is weak squares are a problem even when there's no pawn on them. And if your opponent weakens squares like Dominic did in this game, then you need to find ways to take advantage of that. You've got to um, get your pieces onto those squares, get your rooks onto the relevant files, and just try to take full advantage. Alright, so anyway, um, see you in the next one. Cool. Thanks for watching.